Hi, I'm Dr. Lauren Tessier of Life After Mold, and today we are going to be chatting about the four different types of mold illness and why it's important to know which one you're dealing with. So stay tuned. So you might find yourself in a situation where you're currently struggling with mold illness treatment. Maybe you're not getting the outcomes that you want and all this hard work that you're doing. And realistically, it could be because you're not using the right tool for the job. So what do I mean by this? Well, it turns out there are more than just one type of mold illness. In general, I tend to classify mold illness into four different distinct categories. And based on the case presentation and what's happening for people, we might might choose a different treatment approach depending on what's showing up. So the first type of mold illness that I see in my practice is in allergy. Allergies are super common in mold and it's all over the medical literature. And the word allergy really tends to elicit a idea of difficulty breathing, itching eyes, dry eyes, cough, sneezing, that kind of picture. However, also in this grouping, I tend to add in mast cell activation syndrome and like over histamine reaction. And so the reason why I don't always refer to it as allergies is because there are plenty of people who go to allergists, they undergo allergy testing, and they don't actually test positive. And so suddenly they have no allergens and, you know, you're fine, you're sent on your way. But in all actuality, you might be someone who has very overactive mast cells and those are the cells that secrete histamine. Or you might be someone who has trouble breaking down histamine. So you have a lot more in the body. And so this kind of allergy slash MCAS slash histaminergic, these types of reactions, again, elicit this concept of, you know, I have an allergy and I, I need to take, you know, Benadryl or these types of things. But it's not really limited to just that respiratory pathway. We see histamine receptors in every single tissue of the body. And so when histamine starts getting involved in someone's picture, we will see many different symptoms beyond that respiratory tract irritation. Some of them could even be anxiety, difficulty sleeping, could even be joint pain or muscle pain. So that's the first one that I want you guys to kind of understand about mold illness. That is our first subtype of mold illness. Our second type of mold illness is colonization and infection. So let's talk about the infection first. Widely accepted in the medical literature that people can become infected with fungus. However, there's starting to be a sea change there. For so long, the medical literature said that only people with those struggling immune systems would develop fungal infections. And as more and more time passes, we realize that is not true. So, you know, we would see historically people with cancer or HIV AIDS or even like diabetes issues where they're having some difficulty with their immune system functioning would get fungal infections. But what we're seeing now is more people who are immune competent, their immune system is working, who are developing fungal infections. And so this is something that we shouldn't write off as quickly as we do. There's many hospitals and physicians out there who see someone who's generally healthy and they immediately just kind of cross the possibility of infection off their list when there could be a deep-seated issue there. So the other part of this subclass is colonization. And the reason why I lump colonization and infection together is because they're almost two sides of the same coin, but maybe one's a little bit more obvious and the other one's a little bit more kind of quiet. And so the colonization is the quiet one. We have these natural biofilms head to toe throughout our body. And that biofilm is exactly what it sounds like, a filmy, almost a mucousy, mucolaginous matrix, almost like a jello matrix. There you go. Think jello, a coating of jello insides. And within that jello, we have quite a few different organisms, your bacteria, your fungi. We even have like viruses and protozoa and all different things that exist in there. However, in a situation in colonization, when we're thinking about fungal infections, we are really talking about a fungus existing in your biofilm and causing some chaos. It's not existing in there silently. And so folks who have colonization issues might have, you know, some fungus hanging out in their biofilm and that fungus is actively getting stressed. It's getting stressed by the other microbes in that biofilm or it's getting stressed by the immune system attack from the host. And so what these fungi do hanging out in the biofilm is they start secreting, you know, mycotoxins or different secondary metabolites that upset and inflame the system. So while it's not clearly an infective issue where the white blood cells are on the march and we're going to go fight this infection, it's just kind of this like smoldering little like thorn in the paw, you know, like it is a 
very quiet and really not obvious often issue where the fungus is existing in the body. So that is our second type. Now moving into our third type of mold illness is mycotoxicosis. And so that's a really long word, the toxic state from molds. And in there, you'll hear mycotoxicosis. There's the mycotoxin. That is the toxic part that these molds are producing. And so mycotoxicosis, unfortunately, is less accepted in the medical paradigm. And the reason why is because we don't have the double-blind research to do to make a very clear distinction about mycotoxins. Meaning, in a medical study setting, you need to make sure that you're not causing harm to whomever or whatever you're studying, right? So it is unethical for me to go and expose someone knowingly to mycotoxins because they cause damage. And so this is why we don't have double-blind placebo-controlled trials where someone's exposed to mycotoxins and someone isn't. However, what we do have is plenty of information on groups of people who have been exposed that have almost like they're looking at them after the fact and kind of tracking them and seeing what's happening with their own incidental exposure. We also have many human cell lines where we've put mycotoxins into a petri dish with some human cells to see what happens. We have plenty of animal studies, tons of animal studies on the direct impact of mycotoxins. And then we have plenty of animal cell line studies too. So all of this to say, we have tons of information about the toxic impact of mycotoxins on the living being. And unfortunately, because we don't have those double blind studies, which are technically unethical, we don't have that clear cut concept of exposure. And so that's why it gets really downplayed, really downplayed and ignored in our current healthcare system. And so all of that aside, what I want you to understand with mycotoxicosis is that there's a toxic component and they tend to be fat soluble, which means that they can get into every cell in the body. They can hit every little powerhouse of the cell, every little mitochondria in the body. And so mycotoxin reactions are really widespread throughout the system and they can have a really big impact. But unfortunately, this subclass really gets ignored just simply because of the fact that it's not everywhere in the literature and people really have to work to kind of understand it and piece it together. There's not a uh, cheat sheet, a cliff's notes for doctors who are in the rush. So that's our number three, our mycotoxicosis. Now, our fourth and final classification of mold illness is chronic inflammation. And so realistically, this has been, you know, encompassed by this concept of SIRS, C-I-R-S, chronic inflammatory response syndrome. Unfortunately, there's even less research on SIRS than there is on mycotoxins. And so, of course, this chronic inflammatory pattern just kind of gets thrown to the wayside. Now, the important take home about SIRS is that it's a inflammatory issue that keeps going after the incendiary thing is removed. So really simply put, it's like pouring gasoline on a bonfire and having the gasoline burn off, but the fire keeps going, you know? So the thing that triggered it is no longer around, but the inflammation keeps burning through the system. And so those are the four major types of mold illness, chronic inflammation, mycotoxicosis, colonization infection and allergies. And so you might be wondering, well, why does this matter? So I like people to be aware of them because you can really undergo treatment failure because of undergoing treatment for the wrong thing. So for instance, treating a toxic reaction, like it's an allergy, the same way that treatment for allergies won't work for an infection or a colonization. And so it's really important to identify what one that you might have. Additionally, I also want to call out that you could have more than one of these issues. So let's say, for instance, you might have a colonization or infection, and that colonization infection is triggering a toxic response. So you can absolutely have more than one. And in those instances, we definitely have symptoms that will overlap. And so this is why it's super important to work with someone who really takes the time to understand your symptoms, understand kind of the timing of your exposure, and really piece together what type of mold illness this might be. So for instance, if someone gets much better after leaving a house for a day or so, I'm more inclined to think that it's more of like a histamine picture, mostly because a toxic reaction doesn't typically clear up that fast. And so as you sit with a physician who knows what they're doing, they've seen these cases and they can kind of work backwards and understand different timings and different triggers, they can really piece together what type of mold illness. And when you have a good grasp of what type of mold illness you're navigating, the testing becomes a whole lot clearer. And of course, the treatment becomes a whole lot clearer. So if you found this information 
helpful, please follow and subscribe and let me help you find your life after mold.